Good morning, everyone. Nice to have you here um, at our conversation with the trustees. We're just going to let everyone um, enter the room and then we will kick off. So we'll just give it a minute or two. But nice to see you all. Okay, Rosie, are you happy to kick us off? Rosie, we're going to kick things off, so over to you. Rosie, you're muted. Hi, everyone. I'm Rosie Stevenson Goodnight, and I'm so glad to see you here. I'm one of the trustees and the acting chair of the Community Affairs Committee. I'm based in California. I think this is our second conversation with the trustees in 2022, hosted by the Community Affairs Committee. I'm going to start with a big thank you to the trustees and staff for joining us today. A thank you to the community members who submitted questions in advance. A thank you to those of you who are joining us live. And a thank you to those of you who may be watching a recording. We appreciate your participation. So for those of you who haven't joined one of these calls before, the Community Affairs Committee is a board committee. We have a goal to strengthen the partnership between communities and the Wikimedia Foundation. We work to bridge gaps and ensure that community perspectives are represented in the foundation's oversight and decision-making. We've now hosted several of these conversations to promote open dialogue between the communities, the Wikimedia Foundation, and the Board of Trustees. And we've incorporated your feedback from previous sessions including alternating the time slot between sessions to allow for wider participation, more regular and frequent meetings and translation to several languages. We do listen to feedback and I encourage you to share your thoughts and needs with us. Now, before we start the conversation, I'd like to reach out to each trustee to briefly introduce themselves, their name, their role, where they're based and why don't we start with you, Shani? Okay, thanks, Rosie. Uh, hi, my name is Shani Evans. I'm the vice chair of the board. And usually the, the chair of the space committee, but now it's in good hands of Rosie while I'm chairing the product committee. I'm also involved in some other committees like the governance committee, et cetera. Uh, I'm really happy to be here connecting today from the UK. So how are you? Victoria? Uh, hi, my name is Victoria Dorunina. I am based uh, in the UK. I was elected in 2021 uh, with Community Ward. And I'm an acting vice chair and a member of the Community Affairs Committee. And I was on the electoral task force. Uh, thank you. Lorenzo, how about you next? Hello, uh, I'm uh, Lorenzo Rosa from Italy. Uh, I'm also one of the community elected uh, trustees uh, elected uh, in, uh, in, the last, uh, in the last summer. How about you, Jimmy? Hello, I'm Jimmy Wales, uh, founder of Wikipedia and a Wikipedian. Uh, I am based uh, just outside of London, um, as I saw someone in the chat is as well. So it's good to be here. Thank you all for um, 
giving us this introduction about yourself. I think we might have one or two other trustees joining us later. But um, also with us is Mariana Iskander, the Wikimedia Foundation CEO. Mariana, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, Rosie. I might just first ask Luis to introduce himself because I see that he's also on now. Ah, okay. I'm sorry I missed you, Luis. Okay. Go ahead. No. No worries, no worries. So I'm Luis Benicordemilio, based in Sao Paulo, uh, board selected trustee, and I believe one of our newest trustees who just joined January of this year. Great. Thanks, Luis. I am Mariana Iskander, the CEO of the Wikimedia Foundation. Today I'm at home in Johannesburg, uh, and it's nice to see actually lots of familiar names and faces on this call. So looking forward to the hour ahead. Thanks, Rosie. Thanks for that, Mariana. Now we have several other members of the Wikimedia Foundation staff here, some who are here to support us with logistics and others who are gonna be sharing updates related to projects that we, the trustees are overseeing. So what's on the agenda? We'll be covering the board elections, the Universal Code of Conduct and the foundation's annual plan. Time permitting, we'll move on to other topics you may have for us. Now I'd like to introduce you to Lisa McCabe, Senior Manager of Movement Communications. Lisa will be helping to facilitate the session today. Over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Rosie. So yes, I'm Lisa McCabe and I'm based in London and I'll be helping to facilitate the session today. So very warm welcome to you all. As Rosie mentioned, this call will be in three parts. First of all, we'll be discussing recent board resolutions and we'll be taking any questions related to that. And then we'll move on to the Universal Code of Conduct and then take questions on that topic. We'll then turn to the Foundation's annual plan and hopefully have a nice uh, healthy live discussion where you can help shape the plan. This call will be structured a little bit differently from previous CIC calls in that after each update, we will then move directly to the related Q&As. Uh, and then towards the end, we'll be uh, opening up the floor for any other questions um, that, that kind of fall into any other business. And I also just wanted to remind all speakers that we have Japanese interpretation happening today. So please speak as concisely and as slowly as possible just to make um, our interpreter's life as easy as possible. And throughout the session as well, you can ask questions in the Zoom chat here or also in the YouTube chat. And we have also invited people to submit questions ahead of time. So we will be looking at those with each section too. And then if there are any questions live or pre-submitted that we don't have time to answer in the call today, we will post these answers on the event meta page afterwards. We're also taking notes again, which we'll, point to, we'll, we'll post to the, the meta page. And just to let you all know that this meeting is being recorded and will be available on YouTube and Commons afterwards. I also just want to politely remind everyone that this conversation is covered by the Universal Code of Conduct and we will respond to comments and questions that are asked with civility. Now I will hand it over to Luis to give a quick update on the recent board meeting. Thank you, Lisa. So the, the board's official meeting was on March 23rd, but on March 22nd, we had a learning day with our GLAM partners and our thanks to them for their time setting all that up for us. We discussed the annual plan process, the upcoming community selection and election, and the usual board business items like approving previous meeting minutes. Ezra has taken a brief sabbatical to focus on urgent professional needs. The board feels it's important to accommodate these requests when we can. Ezra will return to the full responsibilities on June 1st of this year. On March 24th, the board met in an official capacity to discuss governance issues and check progress against the 2019 governance review. And we made some progress on some items called out in the governance review, but there are areas where we can continue to improve. Resolutions are posted on Meta, and I'm going to give it to Lorenzo to talk specifically about the resolutions related to the 2022 board elections. Thank you, Luis. Um, tell uh, a few things uh, that, uh, um, on which we have made decisions uh, about uh, board elections uh, during, uh, during our meeting. Um, first of all, uh, um, the, well, we, we will have uh, uh, um, an election in uh, this year, which is going to start uh, uh, soon. 
and the structure of this election will be a bit different from what we had in the past. In the past, we had two different processes, one for um, well, uh, the, the voters uh, in the election were uh, individual people, the community elected local seats, and uh, one uh, uh, where well, uh, it was the affiliated organization uh, who voted, uh, the affiliated selected local seats. Uh, this year, uh, we will have uh, a process uh, in which uh, both uh, uh, individual uh, contributors uh, and organization uh, will have a vote uh, at the same time. And it will be, uh, it will be um, in the following way. We will, uh, first of all, there will be um, nominations uh, as usual. People will post their nomination on uh, Meta. That will uh, happen uh, uh, shortly. I think in this week, uh, there will be an announcement uh, for uh, opening the nomination. Uh, Center will be a first uh, step of selection made uh, by affiliates. So there will be a vote uh, using a single transferable vote, which is the same system that uh, we have used uh, in the past, uh, to create a shortlist of uh, six uh, uh, candidates. After that, uh, we will have a second vote where uh, uh, individual contributors from our community will vote to uh, go down from uh, this uh, short list of six to uh, the two people uh, that uh, will then uh, be appointed uh, by the board. So first uh, short listing by uh, the affiliates, uh, then uh, selection by um, the community, and an appointment uh, uh, of those people uh, by the board. So yeah, we have uh, a slide with uh, with this uh, with with also the timeline. Um, we also have a few uh, other changes uh, in uh, in this process. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, from this year, uh, in uh, during the community election, doing selection by individuals, uh, um, we will extend uh, the voting uh, eligibility also to include uh, uh, Wikimedia volunteers uh, that are uh, doing uh, offline work, uh, like uh, uh, editor on uh, organizer, uh, people who are uh, volunteering in chapters, uh, uh, Wikilos monuments organizers, and so on. Um, so, you can uh, uh, be eligible to vote uh, either uh, if you are doing uh, some uh, um, some number of contributions uh, like uh, edit count or you are doing uh, uh, things offline or uh, a number of uh, other uh, more specific criteria that uh, existed uh, also in uh, in the past so this is uh, the overall change uh, on the process uh, of the election. Um, there, are also, there are also a couple of other uh, decisions here. One is that uh, uh, we will uh, open two seats from election. This is not a change uh, from uh, the past. It's uh, like it was uh, uh, three years ago. Uh, but it's important to say that uh, because uh, um, it was a specific decision since uh, uh, currently the bylaws uh, tells us that we need to have between 10 and 16 seats. So what we are saying is that for 2022, we are aiming at 12 seats, while uh, six seats are elected by the community and the affiliates, five seats uh, are uh, um, appointed by the board, uh, and one uh, is uh, Jimmy as a community founder. We are also uh, reappointing uh, uh, Natalia, which is currently our uh, board chair uh, for another three years. She was uh, previously elected uh, during the affiliated uh, selected board seats uh, for two times. Uh, 
Uh, now for her uh, third uh, and uh, uh, final term, because uh, you can only have uh, three terms in the board, uh, she will be directly appointed by the board. Uh, so there will be, uh, um, she's been transitioning to another uh, bucket. Um, we have decided to do that uh, in order to provide uh, continuity uh, in the board uh, as uh, she was uh, elected chair uh, last year and uh, we would like uh, to uh, have her uh, for another few years. And this also has the side effect of uh, um, increasing the community uh, presence uh, in the board because uh, she is still uh, uh, from community, of course, uh, and uh, we will also have uh, another uh, community position, uh, community seats uh, that uh, um, will be opened since uh, there is one more uh, uh, seats uh, available. So um, I think these are the uh, most important uh, changes uh, and news uh, that, uh, that we have. Um, and we can move to any question uh, of, uh, from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo, for the update. Uh, we've had a couple of pre-submitted questions, um, and so we might look at one or two of them first and then move to live questions. So question number one is, the two seats due for renewal this year were seats selected through the affiliate selected board seat process. Why are you replacing this process? Uh, so if I can answer that, uh, the process, what we're interested in on the board is the most diversity and the range of skills. And when we started the consultation about these elections, there was a huge diversity of opinions of how they should be run. We don't have any more the division between affiliate selected seats and community seats. And on one hand, from the chapters, uh, we had a pressure to keep the old process. On the other hand, in the developing communities, especially where they don't have chapters and even user groups, they were saying that uh, we don't need to involve affiliates at all, that all the community elected seats should be selected in by, by the community. Uh, therefore, we tried to find a compromise uh, which would involve affiliates uh, selecting among the candidates and then the community voting on the candidates. And I must say that uh, the affiliates will have to do the most work. They will have to read the statements, assess the candidates and select the best from them, six of them. And then the community will be able to assess the result of work of, of the affiliates and select two uh, trustees. Great, thank you, Victoria. The next question is, what happens if a selected candidate decides that they cannot serve on the board? Would, in that case, another election be held? Uh, again, it never happened before, but it doesn't mean that it wouldn't happen. And uh, Lorenza, who talked about the process of election, uh, has an idea how they should, what happens if somebody cannot serve. So Lorenza, can you please explain what will happen? Yeah, sure. Well, this is... Uh something that uh, we hope will not uh, happen, but of course can happen. And it is important uh, to know in advance uh, how to manage uh, the situation. What uh, you would uh, generally want to do is uh, say, okay, we will appoint instead the person who got uh, the most votes among the ones that uh, were not uh, elected. So. Uh, use the next in line person. 
Uh, however, with a single transferable vote, this is not really easy to do because a single transferable vote does not create a ranking of candidates. It just creates a set of people who are, have been selected. Um, so we have uh, written down uh, a process um, that basically, uh, I will try to avoid the technicalities, but basically um, the idea is that um, you are uh, running the tally again, uh, counting the votes uh, again, removing uh, uh, inside each ranking the candidates, the candidate who cannot serve on the board. So you are uh, simulating an election where this person was not uh, uh, present in the first place. Hopefully, in this way, you would uh, end up uh, with a new set uh, of uh, elected uh, uh, people where uh, that person was uh, substituted, uh, replaced by, by another person. Um, unfortunately, I, I said hopefully, because in some circumstances, uh, this does not work and could lead to a result which is uh, incoherent uh, with the previous count. So you need uh, a small adjustment, uh, just making sure that uh, you are not uh, um, eliminating uh, in this process uh, the people uh, who were uh, elected uh, before that, uh, just to make sure that you get uh, to the to a result that uh, still makes sense. So the overall idea is to, anyway, to have a process uh, so that we know what to do if this case uh, uh, happens, uh, and we don't have uh, to discuss it later uh, with maybe some people who say, okay, this is the person to be appointed or no, it's this other person. Just let me clear and avoid the discussions. Thanks. Thank you. And in the chat as a follow-up, we had a question. Can affiliate members who have participated in the candidate selection vote during the gen vote during the general voting too? Victoria, maybe you can. Uh, so, the affiliate is a separate entity which consists of community members. And obviously, the community members that are uh, part of the affiliates can vote as single individuals. So, uh, in the community part of the election, there will be a single transferable vote. It means one person, one vote, right? Uh, Thank you, Victoria. The next question we had, and this is a pre-submitted one, is uh, why will affiliate members be able to vote in the 2022 election when they don't meet the edit count eligibility criteria? Uh, the edit count, it's a very blunt instrument. And we know that the election committee decided to change it for the people who do technical contribution. In other words, uh, to sustain our community and sustain other projects, it's not only the editors who take part, but people who do technical stuff, writing scripts, bots, and so on. And as the movement expands, it's becoming even more important to promote Wikipedia, uh, to promote Wikimedia projects and to attract new editors because it's not a secret that uh, in, in uh, the Global North, uh, the number of editors peaked and people who edit, uh, they do it for many, many years, but we don't have new blood. To attract these new editors, we need to do conferences, do outreach, and uh, uh, collaborate with institutions such as libraries and other participants. This all takes time. You know, it's easier to, to do a little edit, to change a comma, for example, while organizing a local or even national event will take many, many hours to do. And we all know about contribu these contributions. Uh, we're all happy to go to an event, but 
we don't have a metric to uh, to see how many hours was spent and how to translate it into the edits. So in a nutshell, edits are not a universal criterion of participation. Thank you, Victoria. And there's a follow-up um, to what Lorenzo was saying, um, which has been translated from French. Thank you, Mayor. Why segment the vote was the question. Um, segmenting the vote, uh, uh, I, I think the, the question is asking uh, why having uh, two different steps. So first, uh, the... Um, Okay, um, there are two different points here, I think. One uh, is uh, why asking uh, uh, to have both uh, um, affiliates uh, and individuals uh, to have a vote. Uh, and the other one uh, is uh, why uh, doing, uh, in, uh, doing the election uh, in two steps. Um, Having both uh, affiliates uh, and uh, uh, contributors uh, uh, to vote, I think it's important uh, because uh, uh, these are the uh, groups of, of people that uh, are both uh, essential part of our uh, community and uh, uh, that uh, contributes uh, to, uh, to our movement uh, and uh, we need to hear from them. They express different uh, facets of, uh, of our movement, uh, in a way. Um, why building uh, this uh, in a two-step process? Um, well, we, we could have had uh, other ways of uh, having, uh, uh, of taking into account uh, both parts. For instance, uh, having time to vote at the same time, but uh, with different uh, weights. That could be possible, but it's very, complex to do it in a fair way. Uh, we could also have uh, um, different processes uh, as uh, it was in the past. Uh, but we thought uh, that uh, it, was be, it would be uh, better to consider uh, taking in account at the, same, uh, at the same time. Having two steps, uh, it's also helpful to um, ensure that uh, the community votes uh, on uh, a manageable number uh, of uh, candidates. So three candidates, uh, six candidates, sorry, this time, which is uh, decided as uh, three times uh, the number of uh, uh, seats that are open, uh, instead of uh, 20 candidates uh, as we had uh, uh, last year, uh, or uh, 70 candidates uh, as we had uh, in um, um, in the movement charter uh, uh, drafting committee. That was uh, a consistent feedback that we had uh, in, uh, both, uh, in the both elections that we had last year. Um, community members were complaining that uh, so many candidates uh, were uh, difficult to assess and uh, it's, uh, it was difficult to have a, a I mean, to really go through all uh, their uh, nominations, uh, make questions, uh, talk with them. Um, so in this way, we, uh, we hope to make the process uh, in a way simpler and, uh, and more effective. Thank you so much, Lorenzo and Vicky for answering those questions. We're now going to move on for the next 20 minutes to the UCOC. So I'll pass over to Rosie for a bit of an introduction. Thanks for that, Lisa. Um, before asking the staff for updates, I wanna provide a general context around the Universal Code of Conduct phase two enforcement guidelines. The first phase of the Universal Code of Conduct, which produced the policy, was completed in December, 2020. In 2021, a drafting committee convened to create the enforcement guidelines for the Universal Code of Conduct. And a group of people from different parts of the world led this committee. 
We were trying to encapsulate the movement as a whole in the committee by bringing in as many different perspectives and cultures as possible. A community vote was held on the draft enforcement guidelines, as you know, in March of this year. And I'm gonna turn this over to you, Sydney, from our trust and safety policy team to speak to that vote. Thank you, Rosie. Um, we had voters representing 137 communities with the top nine com communities being English, German, French, Russian, Polish, Spanish, Chinese, Japanese, and Italian Wikipedias, and also Meta. A total of 2,283 community members participated in the vote. Out of these, 1,338, which was 58.6% of the participants voted for the guidelines, and 945, which is 41.4%, voted against, against them. As part of the vote, we urged all participants to provide feedback on the reason as to why they supported or opposed the guidelines. This feedback is extremely crucial because it helps us to be able to focus on ways to improve the enforcement approach. Um, 658 participants left comments. We will release a comprehensive report about the feedback in early May. And so I'll give it back to Rosie for, for the next steps. Thanks for that, Sydney. Okay, so the Community Affairs Committee has tasked the foundation to reconvene the drafting committee to review the feedback from the vote and to work with the communities to refine the enforcement guidelines. Other areas for refinement may emerge, but based on early feedback, we're beginning to review four areas. One, to identify the type, purpose, and applicability of the Universal Code of Conduct training. Number two, to simplify the language for more accessible translation and comprehension by non-experts. Number three, to explore the concept of affirmation, including its pros and cons. And then number four, to review the conflicting roles of privacy, victim, protection, and the right to be heard. After the revisions process, the foundation will rerun the community vote to evaluate the redrafted enforcement outline. With regard to the concerns raised with note 3.1 in the Universal Code of itself, the Community Affairs Committee has asked the foundation to immediately review this part of the code to ensure that the policy meets its intended purpose of supporting a safe and inclusive community. I'm now gonna hand it back to you, Lisa, to facilitate the Q&A about the Universal Code of Conduct, please. Thank you, Rosie. So we'll take a few pre-submitted questions uh, to begin with. And the first one is, I am interested in steps to address the request from the thoughtful letter from whose knowledge to remove the harmful language in the UCOC that states, the Wikimedia movement does not endorse race and ethnicity as meaningful distinctions among people. Can you speak to this? I can try to take this one if you can hear me. Um, we have been hearing you know, issues with this phrase and other phrases um, and have directed staff to look into this phrase as Daisy just mentioned. And um, that would be part of the review of the enforcement guidelines, basically. Thanks, Shani. The next question um, is, what about other issues people may have with the policy? What is the plan for reviewing those? So, can I ask Rosie to please do it? Because I think uh, there's too much uh, noise, unless you tell me that you can hear me really, really well. No, I'd be glad to. Thanks, Shani. Um, 
In addition to the revisions process for the enforcement guidelines, there will be an annual review after the enforcement guidelines are in place. This annual review will cover both the Universal Code of Conduct policy and the enforcement guidelines. It's been part of the process since the beginning to address challenges that will undoubtedly arise when the policy is in practice. But of course, if community members raise any issues related to active harm, as with the race and ethnicity line, the review can happen much more quickly. We trust our communities to understand that no policy is going to be perfect and to be thoughtful as they keep in mind the purpose of policy. Any issues that arise are opportunities to improve. Thank you, Rosie. And another question we've had pre-submitted, which, which follows on is, some have voiced concerns that the UCOC requires thinking around consent. How are communities expected to engage with that? I'm happy to take that one, if I may. And Thanks, I think you're welcome to our Japanese listeners. I always learn so much uh, when we have the opportunity to talk. The UCUC, this is probably a useful way to think about it, has been designed as a minimum standard for expected behavior as well as to help identify uh, unwanted behavior. Now, the foundation and the communities have always agreed and the foundation has always trusted in the communities being able to exercise a reasonable person standard. So community members who adjudicate concerns or bring concerns to the attention of the community um, have always exercised the ability to look at the intent and look at the context to the best of their abilities and then find reasonable solutions. I would think about this issue in a comparable manner and it's also long established practice if you think about two examples for um, for example, 26 communities already have rules in place um, or guidelines at least in place related to not gaming the system of self-governance that very heavily depends on both the intent and the context. And in general, communities have done an excellent job um, enforcing that on their own. Equally, the um, blocking reason for not being here in order to contribute to the encyclopedia is one of the oldest and most widely used blocking reasons on many Wikipedia language versions, which very specifically is a question of intent. So the communities are very, very good at handling that. Um, we certainly do not believe that the community drafting committee for phase one assumed a different standard than the reasonable person standard that has always been used across the movement, I think very successfully. So if you think about consent in that context, um, this strikes me as a reasonable way to think about it. Thank you, Jan. So we'll look at ones that have come in live on the chat. So one question is, does the board recognize that there are some community members who have an interest in there not being an enforceable, um, enforceable UCOC with some more socially conservative communities being hostile to LGBTQ plus issues, for example? So how is the board going to balance the needs of minoritized communities uh, and community members with the desires of community subsets to exclude those minorities? Go ahead, Vicky. You're muted. Sorry. So, of course, we recognize that the struggle uh, around the Universal Code of Conduct and especially the enforcement guidelines is about people who feel that they should have a right to oppress anybody who, who is different from them. So that's why it's a great result that most of uh, the people who voted and these are thousands of community members across the board not not only english wikipedia but other communities to accept the universal 
code of conduct and its enforcement. As for the minorities, I am coming from a community that has issues, uh, had issues from the beginning uh, with LGBT members, for example. So I live in the UK, but my main project is Russian Wikipedia. And as you know, Russian government is uh, wildly opposes uh, anything that uh, that gets LGBT community to speak. And I can always say that uh, the community as a whole is much more progressive than the society. And if you look at our rules, it was entrenched from the beginning that everybody has a right to edit as long as they adhere to the guidelines. And universal code of contact just helps to those communities that doesn't have local rules to, uh, to enforce it and to promote it. So I think that universal code of conduct is good for the minorities, of which I'm one as well, because I am a woman. And as you know, uh, uh, women are a minority in most of the projects. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Again, going back to the chat, and it's a follow up from the first question. Uh, it's great to hear that there are plans for the language around race and ethnicity is going to be reviewed. Is there a timeline for that? And it's also helpful to hear that this harmful language can possibly be addressed quicker. But what are the steps that the community should take for this process to happen? And what does that process look like? Is it the committee? Is it the board? Is it trust and safety? Who in the community, uh, who should the community be partnering with and talking to about this issue? Yeah, I can take that one if I may. Um, the expectation is that a timeline will be made available, and Sydney may correct me if I'm wrong, um, early next month. And as Shani has rightly emphasized in her answer earlier, the note in the uh, UCUC section 3.1 will be looked at alongside the other themes um, that the CAC has identified in its letter to the community last week. So this will keep going uh, pretty quickly and should address this um, with very heavy community engagement with the um, drafting committee that will be reconvened in order to look at those five points. Thank you, Jan. And just looking through some more of the other live questions, uh, there was another one saying the scheduling for the guidelines was pushed through in a hurried manner and not all related documents were translated in time for many non-English speaking users to make an informed decision. We've been hearing a lot about creating an inclusive and accessible organisation lately, but uh, for many non-English speakers, uh, they felt they were left out of the process. So there are lots of initiatives at the moment around hubs, global council movement charter, to name a few. So how can we ensure um, that uh, people won't be left out, essentially? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I think there are two points that are very important to make. Uh, one is the work the foundation has gotten significantly uh, better at over the last two years, thanks to the uh, movement strategy and governance team, and as well as the movement communications team, uh, will continue. That's an ongoing learning process. So I do expect the next chapter um, of our shared journey to be even more inclusive than the last one, which was significantly better than the one before. Today's call is a good example thereof, given that it has Japanese translations, for example. Um, the other point that I think is important is that communities are already in an organic adoption process of a lot of the issues that they have helped co-shape together with the volunteer-led drafting committee. If you think about Wikimedia Commons Discord channel, for example, to already vote to adopt the UCUC for its own internal governments and a lot of affiliates are looking at comparable issues. So the amount of information that is available um, to communities in their language and in their context 
um, also with people that they know and trust that they can engage with that have more information thereof organically becomes more um, helpful over time. That's a very common process we have also seen with other global policies. So as we are thinking for the upcoming community consultation process and then the next vote, it will already be in a significantly better state um, than in the last month. And I expect this to be an ongoing journey. Great, thank you. We have a question that's come over from the YouTube chat. Uh, the UCOC has not identified passive aggressive behavior in group dynamics of officials. It assumes healthy community and leadership. How can this be addressed? That's an excellent question as well, I think. There are two answers to this. Um, in, in terms of bringing new ideas um, to the table, as I think has been by now quite widely understood, the drafting committee really is a key instance uh, to surface ideas towards. So because they're the people that draft the actual text. In terms of where there are problems, there was a very interesting idea in an earlier version of the enforcement guidelines, actually, that was quite widely discussed by community and affiliate stakeholders during the first consultation of phase two, I just want to draw attention to. Uh, the idea was to ask the local communities in a safe, inclusive, easily accessible manner, whether they perceive their ability to contribute to their local wiki to be safe, um, and comfortable. That's a very powerful way of thinking about whether the leaders of local communities or the leaders of institutional setups within this movement are actually doing a good job at what they have been elected for in the local context. For example, if you're being elected as an admin team. Um, this was also a conversation that uh, I, for example, had with the Czech user team on English language Wikipedia because it was a very intriguing idea uh, both to them uh, as well as to staff, of course. We did actually run a survey um, earlier this year with a little pop-up tool that we had to build first, where more than 2,500 English language Wikipedians, for example, participated, as well as five other communities, just asking a very simple question, which is, in the last 30 days, have you felt uncomfortable or unsafe contributing to your wiki? The answer thereof, of course, is a very powerful indicator for the question that has been raised. Um, the report thereof is forthcoming and will be published um, soon on Meta, naturally. But I can, I think, quite safely, hopefully not getting a lot of um, anger from the analysts over in technology that run the data at the moment, if I say so, that most communities surveyed actually did a much better job, continue to do a much better job at governing themselves and having their own volunteer members perceive their ability to contribute as safe and comfortable, or at least not unsafe and not uncomfortable, um, than communities might suspect. So in the conversation I had with Czech users, for example, the general sentiment in the room back in December was that probably it's half-half. Right. Half of the community thinks they do a terrible job, half of the community thinks they actually do an okay job. In that particular Wiki's case, based on that data, around 80% of community members reported that they did not feel uh, unsafe or uncomfortable contributing to the Wikis. In another instance, that number was significantly lower. So data of this nature, if we gather it more consistently, more reliably, really can help communities evaluate for themselves how good um, they do a job, how they can potentially learn from other communities that might do better, or whether they really should be engaging with some of the newer institutions the drafting committee has proposed in the UCUC enforcement guidelines, like the U4C committee, if you're having problems like um, the quite widely understood project capture for a couple of years on uh, Croatian language Wikipedia, for example. So I think going down the making more data uh, more easily accessible to communities will be a very powerful uh, way of addressing their problem down the road. 
Thank you so much, Jan, for all your information and uh, insight there. That's really useful. It's time for us to move on to the next part, though, um, which is going to be about the Foundation's annual plan. And I'd like to hand it over to Mariana Iskander just to open the discussion there. Thank you, Lisa. I just want to check that you can hear me clearly before I start talking. Is it all good? Wonderful. It's uh, nice to be back here um, with, uh, again, lots of familiar faces. I am Mariana Iskander, the CEO of the Wikimedia Foundation. I sent uh, an update last week um, sharing some reflections on my first three months at the foundation. I did ask for feedback on how regularly community members would like to hear from me. I provide a weekly update to the foundation staff and the board, but I think weekly may be too much. So if you've got thoughts or feedback uh, for me on that, I would appreciate it. I've just uh, returned home to South Africa after spending some time in the U.S. where um, probably the highlight was bringing together people, both uh, board members, foundation staff, editors, community members. I see some folks on this call that I uh, was able to meet in that time and really to begin connecting at a human level um, and reflected on my sense that that will help us all, I think, build deeper relationships after so much isolation that uh, has been the case over the last, uh, the last few years. When I joined in January, I shared the puzzles and priorities. This was my way of reflecting back what I had heard in conversations uh, over the months before I started with hundreds of Wikimedians all over the world. Um, the one priority that came from a lot of those conversations was the need to reimagine how the foundation approaches planning. We have tried to do that uh, and it's going to be a work in progress. So I'm sure that there will be uh, suggestions for how to keep improving from what we've done so far. One way we started was to really try to ask what the world needs from us now. This was a theme that I heard from volunteers in my conversations last year a fear that we can become too inwardly looking, a need to make sure that we're engaging the outside world in our own strategy and on our own thinking and our own approach. We put together um, a set of trends. We uh, converted that into uh, a diff post. We asked for further insights and input from community members and got some really uh, useful reflections we then spent time really thinking about how to align the foundation's planning with the movement strategy in a much more explicit way, anchoring on the strategic directions of knowledge equity and knowledge as a service, building on the movement strategy recommendations as well. I think that um, the experiment we're most excited to try is to really shift this process from just one way information sharing about the foundation's plan, but try to engage in what feels a bit more like two-way planning, really asking what others are doing on similar issues, engaging in the strategic priorities, for example, of chapters and affiliates, trying to see if that kind of planning can help us all better visualize what the needs are gonna be across communities and see if further collaborations can be um, deepened. Um, last Thursday, we issued a draft on Meta uh, in multiple languages. The hope is that that allows for uh, more open engagement. We have already started getting uh, some questions and are responding to those. The one thing I would like to say is that the goal is not to have a list of every single activity that's being done. In some cases, the work that is underway will continue. In other places, we've tried to describe channels, uh, sorry, challenges and offer a starting point. Uh, in other places, we are um, naming experiments that we'd like to try and concrete starting points um, for new ways of working. We're gonna spend the next month uh, collecting not just on wiki feedback, but engaging in conversations today, being a good example, uh, and others that are gonna be hosted across multiple time zones uh, in the next few weeks. Some of those are uh, also focused on specific projects, including commons. We'll have two calls uh, on Wikimedia Commons scheduled in the next week. And to also 
ensure that uh, if, if folks have other questions beyond the annual planning process that I shared in my update or otherwise I'm happy uh, and available to answer those. So I'll look forward to comments, reflections, questions on the annual plan or anything else that you're interested in. I know that some of you on the call um, have sent emails with uh, some questions. If we aren't able to get to those in detail in the time we have today, uh, certainly happy to follow up with you individually um, in emails or even setting up uh, additional calls and conversations. I'll leave it there, Lisa, so that we can get into some engagement. Thank you for that. So for anyone that has had a chance to um, read through and digest the, the draft narrative, does anybody have any points of insight or, or comments or questions for Mariana? So I think we've got one here. Knowledge equity, is there any planning or initiative from the BOT or foundation to support the oral culture community that they don't have any written culture or record of their culture? We have lots of oral culture community, which we cannot put their voices into mostly our written kind of projects. How can we be more inclusive and make sure they're as important as well? Great question, Mariana. So Fianto, I'm gonna do my best. I've only been around for four months, so I'm going to give you what I think is part of the answer, but I would welcome help from other foundation staff colleagues on the call if there's things I've missed uh, or additional points to make, is that I have uh, been aware that actually some of the work on this is pretty far along, Impl uh, movement strategy implementation grants that have been given to various communities to begin understanding how to document um, both oral traditions and, and other sources. Uh, so. My understanding is some of it is uh, happening in order to learn. I think if there are other specific examples or other initiatives that, uh, again, colleagues are aware of or have a more um, in-depth answer for Bianca, I'd also welcome that. Any more comments from any more foundation members here? No. We'll move on to the next question then, which is, are you going to plan to request more budget for language interpretation and translation support for the next financial year? It's a great question. I'll provide a first answer and then Mayor, I might invite your voice uh, into this as well. So we certainly have identified and again, imperfect, but really trying to ensure more multilingual uh, communication and engagement, including in the annual plan itself. I think the question of adding more resources has to start with what are the current resources and are they being used as effectively as possible? The work we've done over the last three months has been that exercise, trying to understand how current resources are being allocated for translation and interpretation support. I was surprised to discover how much language support the foundation actually offers across 52 different languages in different ways. I think the challenge is each team does it slightly differently. And so we may be able to get more impact even from the current resources if we look at how those are um, used and what the impact is. I'm gonna ask Mayur to add more because this is part of what he uh, has been looking at as well. Thanks, Mariana. Um, for those that don't know me, hi, I'm Mayur. I'm the Director of Movement Communications. Um, as Mariana was saying, you know, the, the kind of, the language and interpretation support. Um, there is a lot that different teams are doing. There's lots of new experiments we're doing. I think really the issue is how can we kind of make it more consistent um, so that, you know, every call you attend, every message you receive, uh, you know, it is multilingual um, and not just in kind of how we communicate out, but also how we listen back in, you know, that kind of two-way communication. Uh, how can we uh, sort of make it across the board, like whichever part of the foundation you engage with, you are able to communicate uh, in the language you are most comfortable in. Um, and some of this will involve like bringing uh, resources within the foundation together. But some of this, we want to kind of talk to the movement as well. I think this is an area where the foundation can learn a lot from the movement. We have such massive 
uh, multilingualism uh, in the movement. You know, there's a lot of contributors that contribute translation. So it's something we want to solve with everyone. Um, so, so yeah, uh, I think uh, there's a lot of um, ambition that we have to try and really level up this work to make the kind of language and interpretation support more consistent. There's a lot we need to learn and a lot we need to work with um, all the communities uh, around this uh, as well. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll pick up a few others that have come up in the chat. Um, this is from Butch and it's quite a kind of long one, so I'll, I'll try and read it all out together. While we commend great effort on large scale discussions on movement strategy and universal code of conduct, the foundation uh, has not been actively pursuing discussion and, and improvements towards ease of access, greater accessibility to new and novice volunteers. These such as IP blocking policy, technical debt, outreach volunteers, especially in economically challenged countries, experience inconvenience when their target outreach participants experience difficulty creating accounts or editing because of the IP address restrictions to fight vandalism. I can Thanks, Lise. Okay. go ahead, Jan. I was just going to ask if you could do that. Yeah. Yeah, in, in the absence of, of product and technology, of course, for whom I don't speak. Um, but as a Wikipedian of nearly, give or take, 18 years, I have a fair share of experience with what uh, Botch services, as well as some insights in, into the technical constraints. Um, it's probably a good way to think about the underlying issue, and there are really two. Um, in a way that Risker and Army are actually addressed very well, I think, from a volunteer perspective on Wikimedia L earlier this week. So technical debt really is the underlying weight that pulls a lot of community activity down. Right? This is a theme that has been coming up repeatedly, um, if you think about December, January, with the Wikimedia Commons conversation, now on this item, etc. Um, if you take risk as metaphor, which I think is a good one for non-technical conversations or thinking about technical debt, like the need to maintain your house. Um, and then you look over the years, the Media Foundation staff actually did a study on this uh, in 2019-20 that's publicly available with high level findings on the developer slash maintenance site on wiki.org. Um, so that was the last time we checked. The technical debt is something like a third of all our core code base in production. Now, if you're uh, coming from a technical background and you know how modern platforms are supposed to be run, there shouldn't be any technical debt, right? Because technical debt breaks, it puts your users at risks, um, it makes their life a lot harder, etc. So we have last time we checked, a couple of years ago, a third. That does not even account for all this helpful scripts and tools and gadgets and extensions the community has written itself over the years and sometimes continues to maintain, in some instances does not. So we know that the overall technical debt is actually bigger than that. Now, the underlying strategic issue that absolutely I agree with this merited larger movement discussion is basically here is the amount of features and code that we have in production that is supposed to enable our communities to do the work. Our ability to actually maintain those tools, continue to maintain the house is somewhere down here. For, for core code, something like 92% last time I checked of all work done on this code issue, code discrepance, uh, was done by people who are either directly or through affiliates indirectly on the Wikimedia Foundation's payroll. So it's really Wikimedia Foundation game, uh, which is absolutely right about that. But the gap is huge, 30, 40% of all the things. Um, there are really three things one can do. One can try to ship around the edges. That's something the foundation has tried to do year after year. But just like with the house, 
if you don't do all the maintenance every year, maybe because you don't have the resources all the time, and you push it to the next year, over time, your house maintenance gets more difficult. Um, or you try to address this gap, either by pulling on both ends, or by either pushing one up or pulling the other down. But you ideally want to have this match in order to support the communities the best way. So the gap is huge. We know about this for years and it will be one of the big questions really uh, on the journey to the strategic direction 2030, um, how to close that gap because it affects every community member um, that chooses to contribute, but also our readers and quite frankly, the Wikimedia Foundation's ability to do its work as well as the affiliates to do their work as well. Uh, because our movement heavily depends on that platform that shared space of knowledge, co-creation and creation. Thank you so much, Jan, for that answer. The next question is around uh, regional approach. So I see that foundation current, the, the foundation currently is working on distributing resources by having them uh, kind of take a regional approach. Do you have any concrete plans to share how the ideal or dream structure for this regional approach would look like in the future? And how would we make sure that there are no uh, overlaps with the current kind of works or programs between WMF, the chapter and user groups? I mean, thanks, uh, Bianca, for that question. I mean, you'll, you'll have more historical context even than me, but the movement strategy recommendations that called for both decentralization and more equity in decision-making, I think have already led to regionalization. So the process of the um, uh, grants program, which I know has taken cycles of learning and changes um, already happening on a regional level. In fact, many other foundation functions um, have already been regionalized. The goal identified in the plan this year is I think to do exactly what your question is asking for. Ensure that amongst the things that are already done on a regional level are people connecting and seeing each other and ensuring, again, that existing resources are having maximum impact and being used uh, in the best way as we think about what new and additional resources may be needed. There's one level of that coordination that is at the foundation level. So to the extent that at the foundation level, people are working in the same regions on different issues, ensuring that that is really against uh, um, shared goals that make sense. But more importantly, which again is what's in your question is, what are the activities already underway in those regions? And how, again, how do we try that two-way planning in a more deliberate way. I think that the regional calls that are being set up uh, in different time zones are gonna help give us a bit more information. I think some things frankly are already working well. And so we just need to figure out how to learn from those and, and do more of that. The one issue that I'm still learning about, so uh, you or others on the call may have views is how the hubs piece then fits into that as well on a, in terms of, regional structures and how, uh, how things are gonna work in a more decentralized fashion. So the intent is to try to understand what's happening so that we can respond contextually and not assume there's a global approach to everything. I don't think there is uh, on most issues. And to make sure that the work happening amongst chapters and user groups, but also you know, individual editor initiatives at a regional level at a minimum are more lifted up and more connected. Um, that will either give us opportunities to grow things. It may give us opportunities to connect things that are similar interests across, um, across different regions of the world as well. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, and just a follow-up comment there. We need WMF having as priority the affiliate support, especially to those affiliates that don't have paid staff. So I'll go to another question. Um, how will the foundation improve its responsiveness to community technical requests? I'm gonna try to offer uh, an answer. I see Jan smiling. So Jan will add to it or give me, give me some historical perspective. 
I would, I would say there's a couple of things I've observed over uh, the last few months. One is that it's clear we need more visibility on what the roadmaps and priorities are for some of our technical work so that even if we disagree, it's at least clear what the roadmaps are gonna look like for what can get addressed in what way and what fashion. I have seen that some avenues for raising technical concerns feel very unsatisfying for volunteers because they're not getting to the places where the person who either might say no or at least has an answer can provide that. We are experimenting with Wikimedia Commons by trying to engage the community in a set of conversations over the next two weeks to, again, identify whether there is shared priorities and a shared roadmap that might make some of the technical requests that come in uh, at least more visible or at least clearer. I think the challenge is we have, um, if you include language versions, over 740 projects there are not sufficient resources to support those equally and across the board. And trying to be clear what can be done and in what time frames with what resources, I hope provides clarity, even if it leads to unhappiness. And so the work of experimenting with different mechanisms and different projects might teach us something. I feel like we are working hard at the foundation to move forward even as we look for additional executive leadership. We've tried hard not to say everything's on hold until somebody arrives. And so ensuring that our product and technology work continues. But as I referenced in my update last week, have been in a global search for executive leadership in our product and technology space that I think can only help us in terms of shaping our approach and shaping how we work, um, particularly in response to this question. I'm like able to add something from the product yeah. department. Please, thank you. As another example of what we're doing, looking at the what is in practice a regional approach, even though we we handle it by language, but it does have regional uh, effects. Uh, is the work we're doing where we're trying to work specifically with certain wikis. Um, so um, we have the product ambassador program where we over the last couple of years have tried to add more language support and a better support to understand specific wikis so that we can partner with wikis all over the world and be less dependent on them being able to converse with us in English um, so that we can work with Arabic Wikipedia, Indonesian Wikipedia and so on and so forth. So that is one of the many ways in which we're trying to get a broader sense of what uh, various parts of the movement uh, need from us in the product development. Yeah, I, I think Johan covered that well. I would just add one point uh, where this question actually very strongly correlates with the question about technical debt. So if, if you are a community member, and I've filed plenty of Fabricator and Baxilla tickets before that myself, um, you, you look at what you want fixed and it looks really small and, you know, you, it's really hard for me as a community member along saying, for example, to say, well, why just can't someone go there and fix the thing? If I could, technically I would do it myself, but I can't. That's why I filed back. Um, the problem with this question really intersects with the other issue is, is the technical debt, uh, because it limits your visibility into how big is this ask really. But also, and this is equally important, more often than not, it also limits the visibility of the technical staff that tries to help you in trying to estimate the technical complexity of trying to deliver the fix you want. Uh, this is a problem if you just want something quickly fixed, but also if you think about community requested tools um, that were co-developed with the foundation, for example, most notably uh, as a practical example, partial blocks which was, was rolled out in line with Johann's example on small community after request by um, admin teams and functionaries. And before it even hit the first community wiki, and Sydney may well recall this because she was one of the people heavily engaged in that, it was rolled out on test wiki, which is specifically a testing ground for the communities to toy with new tools. 
And in that process, before it hit any of the content community wikis, they found a bug through community testing on that little really marginal wiki that is well isolated but it's part of production and somewhere over on wiki data so entirely unexpected that led to disruption that's a really good example of technical debt and how it makes communities lives harder but also the life harder of the um, staff members not just at the foundation but also if you think about a lot of affiliates trying to address technical needs so these two things really come as a package and we need to have this holistic conversation sometimes in order to find solutions that actually work well for communities and make sense from a technical perspective. Thank you, Jan and Johan. So we have about 10 minutes left just to open the floor to, to any other business and, and other questions. I can see one has come through on the chat. How do a local language uh, communities will be supported during the UCOC election because most of the local communities don't speak English? I may be wrong. Uh, but my assumption is, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, that this is a question related to a potential election of the Universal Code of Conduct Committee that supports specifically communities that don't have their own local arbitration committees. Um, just like with a lot of the material uh, and a lot of the work done through the phases, uh, my expectation is that staff will be working very hard in line with Mariana's outlined plan for continued improvement of translations, not just of material, but also facilitation uh, of actual conversations to ensure equitable participation across communities. Uh, it's worthwhile recalling that more than 90% of our active contributing volunteers actually cluster on something like the 22, 25 biggest wikis. So that's a good place to start. But if you think about UCUC phase two, for example, um, staff had been given the goal to specifically not target these communities only, but to bring in an, at least an additional 25 emerging communities. So there's a very clear planning lens across departments, not just in the project team, um, to make sure that equitable access to these kinds of decision-making processes um, is there. Um, this is both a question of material, uh, of facilitation process, but also, and this is where it actually touches upon the other question, of interface, because quite often, navigating an interface in a language that you are unfamiliar with can be an undue burden, especially if you do so on mobile interface, right? If you are on a desktop, you can always juggle some of these things, but specifically smaller communities quite often use disproportionately mobile interfaces. So that's an added burden as well that we are very well aware of and try to address. Thank you. Um, I can't see any other questions in the chat, but if anybody uh, would like to unmute themselves and, and say any comments or, or put any questions direct, um, please go ahead and do so. So, Butch, thank you. You said there should uh, there should be maybe investments on legal clinics to those who seek assistance in interpreting the IP laws. Uh, and, unless someone else has thoughts on that. And I do apologize that I'm talking quite a bit. Uh, but this is a question that the movement has looked at uh, quite often. And I, I don't have an answer, but I can probably provide some context. Uh, the movement has always had to work with, and this includes both, both the foundation as, as well as all of the communities and the affiliates, with the following quite interesting problem. And it's a problem on legal conversations as such, but also if you think specifically about training material that can be put together. Uh, and Movement Strategy, I thought, quite thoughtfully approached that in the community written recommendations. So the, the basic barrier is, the Wikimedia Foundation attorneys, right, the long-standing lawyers we all love and trust, a lot of them have been here for up to a decade or more, um, are not allowed 
to provide legal advice to anyone but the Wikimedia Foundation as an organization. So they can't uh, support, for example, legal clinics. Now, the way historically we have as a movement, knowing this, uh, tried to address these issues is indeed to find solutions either within editing communities. Some editing communities have highly sophisticated um, volunteers that handle copyright uh, requests, for example. Or, and this is quite common in continental European language versions, um, have collaborations between the local language Wikipedia and affiliates. For, for example, Wikimedia Germany has a long track record of hosting legal workshops for members of the German language volunteer support team. They're very popular. Uh, and because they are not the platform provider, they can actually bring in lawyers with the expertise to sit down on a weekend and discuss with the volunteers that do the work in support of their local communities, the questions that they're most interested in. So that, that's a good way of thinking about this in a lot of contexts, I think. Now, if you think about something that's more globally accessible, um, that would be training materials. Here again, the Wikimedia Foundation itself is really constrained in how it can produce training materials on certain subjects. Um, this is also not a novel thing. For example, uh, one of my team's trust and safety operations has a long standing co conversation with some Czech users about how the Czech users could co create training modules for new Czech users because it's a very delicate community elected tool where you can do a lot of things that are concerning if you don't know already what you're doing if you don't have the experience. Um, the foundation, thankfully, um, and Motivated by Movement Strategy, and ASAF actually is leading a lot of that work, has been investing in an online learning infrastructure called um, learn.wiki that you can access through the central authentication system, meaning through your normal Wikipedia or Wikidata or Wikimedia Commons account. Um, that would be a good destination for the first time. It's easily accessible where one could create either from the community side or co-create uh, learning materials on these more delicate issues. Uh, in general, I think co-creation is always the best approach for most of these learning materials. Um, that has been true for the last 10, 15 years. If you think about the um, event safety booklet, for example, that was introduced significantly way back and then later taken up, updated and translated and is now widely used across the ecosystem for in-person events. That was also co-creation. Thank you, Jan. Um, I'll just read out a quick comment from Sydney. Uh, movement strategy and governance facilitators will translate the election materials and hold community conversations about the next phase of the UCLC. Volunteer translation network uh, will also be notified of materials that need translations. Um, and a final question from Butch: What will be the foundation? What will be the foundation to deal on requests? from communities to hold conferences and meetings amid the pandemic and transition to normalcy. So essentially, what, what is our approach to going back to in-person meetings for volunteers? I can give a brief response. The community resources team, I believe, provided uh, guidance about a month ago on allowing um, all uh, movement entities to use funds for uh, international travel and conferences as appropriate. I think we're all trying to figure out uh, what feels safe and what feels uh, appropriate to do in varying parts of the world as we continue to monitor and track the pandemic. Uh, we see that Wikimedia Deutschland is gonna experiment with a hybrid approach uh, for the summit. I think we'll all be interested to learn from that. 
Wikimania will also have uh, primarily virtual and some regional uh, components. And so it feels like trying to ensure that these big events that are experimenting with in-person and virtual components will teach us um, but certainly the guidance that's been issued on the use of funds for travel, I think, um, was clear that uh, movement entities can proceed as they see best. Right. Thanks, so Owen. Time. Other events as well, other hybrid events. I think trying to figure out how to learn from all of those will be important. And I'm sure people are very much looking forward to meeting up in person again. So I think it's time for us to wrap up. Thank you so much, everyone, um, both uh, attendees and uh, speakers for joining us today. Just to remind you all that there will be a recording of this call and it'll go up on Commons uh, and also YouTube where we streamed live. And we'll also be posting notes on the Meta page as well as any answers to questions we didn't cover. Um, if you really enjoyed this call and want to join us again for the next one, um, I'll put in the chat that you can email askcac at wikimedia.org and we'll add you to the list. And you can also send through your questions in advance. So I'm going to hand it over to Rosie just to close things up. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. My thank you to all of you, too. This has been a very rich conversation. Before you hop off, we'll be running a quick poll to see how you felt about today's call. So please take a moment to respond to the poll. You can, of course, also email your feedback to askcac at wikimedia.org. That's A-S-K-C-A-C -C at wikimedia.org. And Lisa is going to put the poll in the chat, maybe Belinda into the YouTube. There it is. And we'll have the results up here real quick too. If you care to go ahead and vote on the Mentimeter. Great. Well, thank you, Rosie. Thank you to all our speakers um, and attendees. And thank you for the feedback as well. We can see that all in front of us now. So that's that's really appreciated. And we look forward to uh, hopefully seeing you all again at the next CAC meeting, which will be in June. So keep an eye on the Meta page for more details. Have a wonderful day, everyone. And uh, thank you also to Gary, who did our um, live interpretation for our Japanese audience as well. See you soon. Take care. Bye.